Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 160, April 8th to April 14th, 1864. Last week, we spent our time in southern Arkansas talking about the 1864 Camden Expedition. This will be an operation that will see Frederick Steele try to do his best to support Nathaniel Banks and his Red River operations. Although, there was essentially no way for them to communicate with one another. Speaking of the Red River campaign, we will go there this week to see what's going on in that neck of the woods. At the end of the episode, we also talk about one of the more infamous events of the war, the massacre at Fort Pillow, and hopefully put that into better context. First, though, let's head to Louisiana. Of course, we will talk about our Patreon content here, and for the month of April, we will be doing a picture slideshow. This one's going to be of uh, the current site of the Battle of the Wilderness, and I know the wilderness here is coming up pretty fast on us here in May, uh, and it is the first week in May, in fact, so I think it's a good pairing with that to kind of go through the site. I know we're kind of jumping the gun just a little bit, but we will be doing a picture slideshow of the current battlefield, what it looks like today, the important sites that we will be talking about there at the beginning of May, and then we will be going back to the well of movie reviews uh, here in May proper, and that's going to be a field of lost shoes that goes over the new market uh, battle with the VMI cadets, which is a interesting movie, I think. Uh, and so we will be reviewing that and talking about the historical accuracy of it. And if any of that sounds like that would be interesting to you, there is a link in the show description for the Patreon. And of course, those proceeds do go toward the general upkeep of the show. They're greatly appreciated. So let's head to the Red River campaign. So far, things have been going pretty well for Banks. Not that he could have known it, but Steele was making decent progress in his march on Camden, and his actions against Richard Taylor were going accordingly. His troops were moving up the Red River, and after Porter's capture of Alexandria, were now turning west in the direction of the Sabine River so as to hit their ultimate target of Shreveport from the south. So far, there was going to only be light engagements with the Confederates as they were falling back because they had fewer numbers. Maybe a siege at Shreveport would be in the offing. But Taylor, as we have briefly highlighted, was an aggressive battlefield commander. He was not content with giving up ground, and even if he was, he needed a purpose. His purpose was to gather additional troops, which reportedly included paroled troops from Vicksburg as well as a local militia. Besides his Louisiana contingent, he would have Missouri and Arkansas troops added into his command, giving him almost 10,000 men, a number he had not yet been fortunate to have. William Franklin and Nathaniel Banks would have their army strung out on the road as they made their way toward their target, oblivious that there could be any real threat. It would be south of a place called Mansfield, where Taylor would turn and make a stand against the Yankees. He picked a good spot near the Moss Plantation, and from there, he could have a good plan of attack on the Mansfield Road. Sarah Moss would actually describe the dispositions outside her family's home. The balance of the troops of Walker's division after marching, countermarching, and maneuvering was formed up in the line of battle about 2 p.m. behind a rail fence, enclosing the Moss Plantation. The left on the division rested on the line of the Pleasant Hill Road, Scurry's brigade on the right, Walls in the center, and Randall's on the left. After the line of battle was formed, the command was also given to Skak Arms. The fence was pulled down, and the soldiers remained inactive about an hour, awaiting the approach of the enemy, who were reported about one mile in front. Especially, Walker's Greyhounds were eager to get the enemy, not wanting to retreat any more. So Walker would have the right, his troops arching around a road, and actually straddling it with Scurry, Wall, and Randall in that order. Newton's division would be next with Polignac and Gray in the left center and Green's cavalry on the extreme left. Thomas Ransom and his 13th Corps would be leading the way, his two divisions under Landrum and Cameron eventually making an inverted V around a place called Honeycut Hill, 
Remember, the remainder of that command was in Texas. April 8th would be the day in which contact would be made between the two sides. Setting up at the edge of a clearing where Taylor had gathered his forces, Banks would resolve to fight and call up Cameron's division. He had already had Albert Lee's cavalry, who was skirmishing with Green, and the division under Landrum. Indeed, Banks was seemingly unaware of the situation on the ground, him telling Lee to press on to Mansfield and capture it. Lee would respond that this was impossible without a general engagement. This would add to the decision to form up and wait for additional reinforcements. The Confederates would see them around Honeycutt Hill, but delay for some time. Eventually, a general attack was called for in the late afternoon, the rebel lines surging forward. They would be met with the initial fierce resistance from Landrum's two brigades. The heaviest casualties on the day would be from four regiments from his command, including the 77th and 130th Illinois, 19th Kentucky, and 48th Ohio. Alfred Mouton, a local Louisiana hero, would be killed during the attack. Likewise, both the brigade commanders under Landrum would become casualties and Ransom himself would be wounded. Walker's Texans would be able to wrap around the flank of their enemy, causing a rout that would result in a large amount of captured men. Franklin would also be wounded in trying to cobble and rally a defense. Cameron's division would arrive too late to the field, Banks taking a huge defeat, 2,200 casualties being suffered compared to maybe 1,000 on the Confederate side. Smith had sent word to avoid a general engagement, to which Taylor responded, Too late, sir. The battle is already won. Indeed, William Emory's division needed to come up and stem the tide of the Confederate advance, especially with some skirmishing work by the 161st New York. Much as like Banks' defeat by Jackson in the Valley Campaign, there was a large amount of supplies gathered in by the victorious rebels. The Chicago Mercantile Battery, which had seen good service in the Vicksburg Campaign, had lost its guns some of 18 captured on the day. This was really a setback that Banks could not afford. I think Banks and Taylor, if we really look at it, are both going to be drawing on their experiences, their previous experiences, fighting in the Valley. Obviously, Richard Taylor doesn't think very highly of Nathaniel Banks. That's part of the problem in that Kirby Smith wants him to give a lot, a lot of ground, but he's like, I already defeated this guy essentially with Jackson in the Valley. He doesn't seem to be a very competent general, so why not go ahead and turn around and attack him? And he does have a very Jackson-style uh, combat here at uh, Mansfield, but as we're going to see, he's going to get a little over his head because you know Richard Taylor obviously is not Stonewall Jackson. Now on the flip side of that, we have Nathaniel Banks. He's going to want to get redemption from his actions in the Valley, obviously, he ended up losing a lot of supplies there. If there had not been a snafu with the Confederate cavalry, that victory might have been even bigger for the Confederates, really, had they been able to cut off the retreat of the Federal Army there at Winchester. So he's going to be desperate to change the narrative, and rightfully so. And this Red River campaign, while it's not necessarily, as we mentioned, in terms of Grant's overall strategy, it's not really as important as the other operations, it wouldn't be as important as a potential thrust at Mobile, Alabama, for instance, he is going to want to get some of that street cred bat. And so far, he just hasn't been able to quite get there yet. The Union Army would fall back to a place called Pleasant Hill. Taylor, wishing to emulate his former commander, Stonewall Jackson, would wish to complete the route of the enemy. Pleasant Hill would see reinforcements for both sides. On the Confederate side, we see Parsons, Missouri men and Churchill's Arkansas command move to the front, having arrived too late to the fighting on the 8th. A.J. Smith and his brigades from the 16th Corps would set up on high ground defensively, known again as Pleasant Hill. Taylor, of course, would decide to attack, him thinking that the Union Army was in disarray, something that the previous result would have supported. The Federals would set up around a roadway, with Shaw's brigade and Dwight's on the right flank. Utilizing the terrain, Benedict's command would be in the south and east of their comrades on the right. Walker's Texans would be on the Confederate left, with Churchill and Parsons on the Confederate right. It would be Walker's command pressing the Union right, along with Majors and B's cavalry, to open the contest. <laughs> 
Originally, the Union troops would stand and fight with fierce resistance. The 14th Texas and Horace Randall's command would be used to break this defensive line, their colonel, Edward Clark, being wounded in the attempt. On the opposite flank, Churchill's men would be popping out of the woods and engaging Benedict's command. Louis Benedict, an attorney from New York, would be killed in the action and his brigade would break. Taylor had intended for his men, in this part of the field, to be moving into the rear of the Union Army. However, the local guide had misunderstood exactly where to place his striking force. Instead of coming out in the rear, Churchill's men were in a prime position to be hit in the flank by A.J. Smith's command, his veterans using a fire that was devastating, and a charge which included hand-to-hand -hand combat to wither away the grand assault by the rebels. With the attack stalled, this would allow the Union Army to retreat once again in the direction of Grand Encore, Banks wishing to discontinue the campaign. Casualties were again fairly high, with 1,300 on the side of the Union and 1,600 on the side of the Confederates. Taylor would give chase, but he would be doing so without Walker and Churchill. Those divisions would be shifted to Price and his command, which had so far given ground, but now would be ready to try to deal a blow to Frederick Steele and his Camden expedition. We will see that action next week and then conclude the Red River campaign in the episode following, so stay tuned. So once again, we have Richard Taylor. He's going to sort of understand that the troops might be allocated somewhere else. In this case, they're going to be sent to Price, and we're going to see that as mentioned. However, he's going to want to capitalize on his success, and instead of kind of letting things lie as they were, Banks would have withdrawn. And we have seen this in previous campaigns before where Banks is going to advance into a part of Louisiana. You know, we talked about Irish Bend where there was some success and then they retreat. Well, now there's been a setback and they're going to retreat and Taylor's going to want to try to really drive home a victory. And in so doing, he's going to suffer these casualties that quite frankly, really in this region of the war, they really just can't afford, right? It's, the same story as we see in other places in the Confederacy where there are troops that need to be allocated to several different places. There's a constant shifting of troops around. And even in this singular department, we have Kirby Smith. It's like, now I got to take these guys from over here and shift them back. So obviously uh, we have that happening here and Taylor's not going to be particularly happy about it. Now we will switch gears and talk more about the infamous incident at Fort Pillow. Now, Nathan Bedford Forrest, I believe, is often chalked up as being problematic for two main reasons. The first is that he is involved in the KKK after the war, although he is not the founder, as some people wrongly believe, probably because they watched Forrest Gump. The second is that during the war, we have an unfortunate incident at Fort Pillow, which sees not only black troops, but white Tennessee troops be murdered at the hands of his men. Now, we need to put everything into context before we talk about the actual battle itself. Obviously, the perspective of many Confederates is the addition of black troops was a problem. Remember that there was always the specter of slave rebellion in the antebellum period, so we have a lot of rebels writing about how they consider white officers to be inciting said rebellions after arming their black troops. That kind of upheaval of social norms would not sit well with many so we can at least understand the mentality there, of course while not agreeing with it at the same time. Now on the flip of that, we also have the pro-Union Tennessee troops, which we may not have talked about too much in depth. There were various commands that acted almost as anti-irregular independent commands. Fielding Hurst was one such commander who was over the 6th Tennessee Cavalry. Hurst was considered to be a major public enemy by the Confederates on par with, say, Benjamin Butler, or Robert Milroy. Forrest would consider him to be a criminal for having extorted civilians out of money. Pro-Tennessee men would also be a little more brutal in their tactics as we have seen all across the border states and pockets of pro-Union resistance in the South. To make matters even worse, there were those in these commands who had previously served in the Confederate Army. This will be a concept we should remember shortly. You remember that Forrest had decided with the blessing of S.D. Lee to move into Kentucky and Tennessee, making some recruitment trips and generally causing mayhem amongst pro-Union civilians and Yankee operations in general. 
if you remember that Paducah, Kentucky had been a target of Forrest, but it had ended in failure. Remember that Colonel Thompson, a local, had dealt an ill-advised charge, possibly claiming that Forrest had authorized such an attack. Part of the defense was actually a contingent of colored troops, which may have made the defeat all the much more stinging. Forrest, it should also be said, might have been suffering heavily from personal losses. We talked previously about how his artillery officer had been probably murdered by Union troops after having been captured, and his brother had also died at Okalona. It is hard to tell the degree to which it affected his decisions, but it must have been hard to swallow. In the meantime, Forrest had also authorized an attack on Tennessee loyal troops at Union City, which was carried by deception, one of Forrest's subordinates taking a page out of his book and making it look like there were more men than there were actually present. Additional successes against Suey Smith's command, including against loyal Tennessee units, would make Forrest feel better about how things were going, but he would want a much bigger prize. What bigger could he ask for than seizing a key position along the river, which meant maybe he could even disrupt river traffic? North of Memphis, as well, would be a key morale boost for the Confederates in the area, and obviously would make the pro-Union population uncomfortable. Memphis, it should be said, was a site where a lot of troops were being housed because it could be used as a quick response area depending on the kinds of threats the Confederates sent their way. Remember, Hurlbut was commanding in this department. Any strike at Fort Pillow would need to be quick. April 12th would see the elements of Forest Command start to converge on their intended target. Chalmers would have operational control of the situation and deploy sharpshooters. Now, Fort Pillow had three lines of defense and a high bluff over the river. There were a lot of ravines and rises that made the landward side defenses sometimes inadequate and susceptible to sharpshooters. The Confederates would begin by sending out and taking shots at the Union defenders. Now inside the fort were several sections of colored artillery under Lionel Booth and Major James Bradford, who had several companies of Tennessee troops. Sixty or so of these men out of the 200 were former Confederates. The sniping by Confederates would prove very deadly and even take out Major Booth as he sighted a cannon. With Forrest on the scene, the artillery would continue to try to operate, also with the help from the USS New Era, a gunboat on the river. Rebels were trained to take pot shots at the portholes to try to neutralize this threat. Forrest would arrive and actually endanger himself. He would be hit with a spent canister round, and again in the back of the neck. A horse was also hit from under him. I have seen it in some of my research that Forrest was actually concussed, and that may have been impairing his decisions. We saw previously how Joseph Hooker receives what is most likely a concussion at Chancellorsville, and that's going to also impair his decision making, and the same thing could be said of Forrest here, although, again, we're not trying to make excuses necessarily, it's all just kind of laying out all the facts so as not to be one way or the other, right? So, certainly Forrest may have been concussed, and obviously there are individuals who are at fault all along the story here as we're going to get into. A smaller unit of men would be able to approach the fort in the meantime and actually gain the ditch before the works. The defenders were unable to depress their guns or they risk also exposing themselves to the sniper fire. Forrest would wish to try to take the fort without bloodshed and without the possibility of it being reinforced. He would send warn to the commander of the post, still believing Booth was in charge. Bradford would stall and actually get some time to think about it. Interestingly, Forrest would also mention that the garrison would be treated as prisoners of war, obviously a concern for all those involved, but that he could not be responsible should it be refused. In the meantime, the garrison would be given alcohol, and there would be some trash talking with the Confederates as they approached near the defense. This might have added into the anger shown by the Confederates. Forrest would grow impatient with Bradford and once again demand for the surrender. Bradford, though, would refuse. No, Forrest would need to take Fort Pillow by assault if he wished to see a speedy conclusion. And that's something else that I think has been pointed out in some of the sources that I, at least I have seen that, I mean, Forrest wants to make sure that this happens quickly, right? Even if the garrison is to surrender, 
He doesn't necessarily want to be bogged down with any unnecessary hindrances that are going to allow him to escape. So had that happened, it kind of rules out sort of a whole scale massacre situation, right? If treat them as prisoners of war, parole them, whatever, right? The garrison, even though there are these, once again, in the eyes of the Confederates, these problematic units in the United States Tennessee troops and the United States colored troops. So, so that is something to consider. Something else to consider too, is that he had already used this kind of threat at Paducah, right? We mentioned how Forrest says, well, I'm not going to be able to necessarily guarantee that everyone's going to be spared if you don't surrender. And whether he was actually going to follow through on that or whether he was just trying to intimidate the enemy commander into surrendering the garrison without much of a fight, it's hard to say. But there are plenty of sources that would cite that it's probably the latter of those. He doesn't necessarily want to have a his men show a complete lack of discipline and then obviously not take any prisoners. The assault itself was not a difficult affair, although Forrest's men did suffer casualties covering the narrow ground to the earthworks. Since there had already been accurate sharpshooter fire, the gunners were depleted in ranks, and some Confederates already established a beachhead in the ditch. Their assault into the work itself would come in a great wave. Panic would take over the defenders, and the rebels were moved into a frenzy. Now what happens next is open to debate. What cannot be debated, however, is that the Confederates, in many cases, do not take prisoners. In most of the battles we have talked about, the amount of wounded is greater than killed, but at Fort Pillow, there were more men killed as opposed to being wounded. There is a great likelihood that more men could have been taken prisoner, but were shown no mercy, either with a bayonet or pistol. Now on the flip side, there were also accounts of not only the garrison being drunk, but also there was still some firing going on while the men were trying to surrender. Even if this happened on a smaller scale, combined with the tensions already boiling around the East Tennessee men and the black soldiers, it did not bode well for the restraint of the command. First-hand accounts would describe the slaughter. One Confederate wrote, Our men were so exasperated by the Yankees' threats of no quarter that they gave but little. The slaughter was awful. Words cannot describe the scene. The poor, deluded Negroes would run to our men and fall to their knees, with uplifted hands, scream for mercy, but they were ordered to their feet and then shot down. The white men faced but little better. The fort turned out to be a great slaughter pen. Blood, human blood, stood about in pools, and brains could have been gathered up in any quantity. I, with several others, tried to stop the butchery, and at one point had partially succeeded, but General Forrest ordered them shot down like dogs, and the carnage continued. Finally, our men became sick with blood, and the firing ceased. Now, this account does actually have General Forrest jumping in there and saying to continue the carnage. What is unclear is exactly where Forrest was during the assault. He might have been well far back from his troops, and that could have been part of the problem. Again, he might have been experiencing some kind of discomfort, some kind of concussion, so he might not have been, certainly wasn't in the first wave. And there are other accounts that do not include uh, General Forrest saying this. So this could have been exaggeration. I've seen in some cases, uh, some of these accounts obviously were exaggerated. It could have been a different officer too. That's something else that uh, has been pointed out in that it might not have been Forrest. It might have been uh, Chalmers. You know, again, it's hard to say. There's a lot of different accounts that have a lot of different uh, ways in which how it all went down. Bradford would move his men to the river. It is possible they had a prearranged agreement with the gunboat New Era, and he was expecting support or reinforcements. Even if Canister had kept the Confederates at bay, that would have been a big help, especially considering the rebels wanted to make sure the action ended quickly. Part of Forrest's command had flanked the position and fired the enemy, even while some attempted to swim to safety. Guns from the fort were turned on the gunboats, ending any real hope for the defenders. Reportedly, some civilians would also drown in the river, attempting to escape the rebels. Bradford himself would be taken prisoner, but he would be killed by the rebels, either by straight execution or for violating parole, it is hard to tell. The extent to which Forrest knew about or authorized the killing of troops is unknown as well. Some claim he did little to stop or even order the violence. Telling, though, is that reportedly he did not call for no quarter 
and he did not go in with the first line of troops, instead going in with the second. Whether he was removing himself to establish an alibi, so to speak, or not, is questionable. It does not help that he writes about the river spreading with blood, sort of gloating about his success at Fort Pillow. A federal surgeon would write about asking for quarter, and initially Forrest would not guarantee this during the action, finding out that he was not the surgeon for the black troops or from East Tennessee, and then granting him guard for his safety. A subordinate of Forrest would also make a demand for surrender at Columbus, Kentucky, citing the lack of quarter that could be potentially given to the garrison, so this is also shaky, not in the favor of being an unfortunate series of circumstances. 221 Union troops will be killed, with only 130 wounded, a large amount of the garrison. Forrest would suffer only 100 total casualties, 14 of which being killed. Wounded men were allowed to go to the gunboats because Forrest wished not to be burdened with them. Many of the prisoners would find their way to Andersonville. The legacy of Fort Pelo is complicated. It tarnishes Forrest's reputation, for sure, and provides fuel for Lincoln's re-election and motivation for other federal units. Now, again, I think it is very important to mention in this episode that not condoning any of the violence that occurs here at Fort Pelo. However, it is very important to understand exactly how this occurred. What are the potential reasons, right? Now, is Forrest 100% to blame, in my opinion, for this? I don't think he necessarily orders it. There's certainly other sources that I've seen that have supported that. He's, he's not ordering this kind of thing to happen. However... He doesn't do a whole lot to stop it. He might have been responsible for kind of jazzing up his troops. Does that mean that we're saying that he's, you know, the nicest of guys? Absolutely not, right? Obviously, he does have some kind of prejudice. He writes about it. and But it is interesting, too, that I've seen in some sources or some firsthand accounts that the Confederates are more upset about the East Tennessee troops being in there, right, than they are against the uh, black troops, right? So there is this very complicated set of circumstances that lead into this event happening, right? Major Bradford, who, you know, unfortunately does end up losing his life in the end. Uh, It's hard to say, you know, be interesting to have heard exactly what his reasoning was. Obviously, he's trying to stall for time, get reinforcements, when in reality, no help is really coming, So he's probably misguided in his attempt to uh, have this time where the rebels are stewing on already bad blood, right? So it's not necessarily as cut and dry as I've seen some older sources say. So it is very important to have all these sides covered when we're talking about these events. So we will go ahead and leave it right there. In the beginning of the episode, we talked about Mansfield and Pleasant Hill in the Red River campaign. Nathaniel Banks is going to be moving his army in a retreat, whereas very recently he had been in a positive situation. We also had the infamous incident at Fort Pillow, otherwise known as the Fort Pillow Massacre. Now, we have a better context for how and why this event occurred, which is always important when we're talking about these more momentous events. Next week, we will head to North Carolina and see some more controversy there, and we will also have a look back into the Arkansas campaign and what's going on in Steele's Neck of the Woods. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website as well as Patreon and Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Feedback is always welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening and have a great week. <laughs>